From the Open Season Property Studio, welcome to Super Talk Outdoors, where we celebrate every single Monday at lunchtime the world-class outdoors of the state of Mississippi because we are the capital of the outdoors in America. I want to thank you for joining us on the powerful Super Talk Mississippi Radio Network. You can also listen to Super Talk Outdoors at supertalk.fm, Amazon Alexa, the Super Talk Mississippi app, or at Super Talk TV at Seaspire TV. But some of you are watching the show on YouTube or Facebook are listening on your favorite podcast, and we really appreciate it. We try to be there whenever, wherever you want to engage in the show. And as I say every week, we really appreciate you, and we very much appreciate the feedback we get, so much positive feedback. It's August the 26th, 2024. You know, listen, uh, dove hunt hunting season is coming up next Sunday, September the 1st. This, this first season will go through... September the 29th, a friend of mine yesterday sent a video from the Mississippi Delta, and I've never seen so many doves. The way the dove field is set up, there are power lines nearby, and the power lines were loaded with doves. I, I hope everyone's ready for the season, and you're going to have a, a really, really good season. And uh, keep in mind now, you don't want to be hunting on a baited field. Just don't want to be hunting on a baited field. And it doesn't work to say you didn't know. So you got to be aware of where you're hunting um, because doves, as a reminder, are, are covered under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And so that's what that's what uh, that's the federal law that regulates migratory birds, which doves are. So uh, if you hunt on a baited field, you could be sentenced to six months in prison or up to fifteen thousand dollars fine and saying you didn't know doesn't work so keep that in mind but so people across the state are getting ready for the season there's a lot of families that come together a lot of tradition that comes together a lot of socializing it's just terrific so the first season starts september the first and incidentally the north zone and the south zone are identical um, it ends on september the 29th and then the second season is october 12th through november the 10th and then there's a third season from December the 27th to January the 26th. And again, both the north and the south zones are exactly the same dates. Hey, listen, I had some a reason I couldn't get up there this weekend, but my son Jordan and my good friend Terry Waldrop went up to the farms we have in the Mississippi Delta and uh, did some work, uh, sprayed some fields, uh, put up some new lock-ons, they put up some some stands we're lucky because where we lease land, uh, the farmer does a terrific job of sort of keeping things, uh, you know, the growth kind of down to a minimum. In fact, Jordan said that at the property up in Mentor City that uh, Travis and his team have done such a good job of manicuring it that you could play golf along the edges of the soybeans. And you love to hear that because that means there's less work for us to do as we get ready for uh, uh, deer season, that, that is for sure. And incidentally, um, as we approach September the 1st and, of course, Labor Day weekend, it's a tradition in my family. We start putting crab traps out on Wednesday, and we'll uh, continue to put the traps out and put them in a holding pen at the pier. And, uh, you know, bowling crabs for us is a great tradition. So if the weather permits, we'll be headed out to uh, Horn Island. We'll spend the day there. We'll come back. We'll boil crabs and enjoy some terrific camaraderie. Um, it's fun for me because I like I like to enjoy the, the kids and, and the grandkids in the process. Used to be the kids and now the grandkids, but we go out and check the crab traps together and and they love it. It's just part of it's part of their growth of uh, growing up in coastal Mississippi, and it's a lot of fun. And by the way, the, the fishing reports all across coastal Mississippi, both offshore and in, in backwaters, has been really good. And that's in spite of the heat. But I say in spite of the heat, instead of 100 degree days, we've actually had 90s, you know, just in the low 90s degree days, and that's awesome. By Wednesday, incidentally. We're looking at a high of 88 degrees uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of this week, and lows uh, in the mid mid 70s. We, you know, we can we can live with that. But fishing's been good, and we are thanking goodness, thanking God that we have not had to deal with any tropical systems. It's been super quiet, and as I may have said on the show before, I'm a bit of a tropical weather nerd. I spent a lot of time on the tropical weather blogs, being a f former publisher, having gone through Hurricanes Camille and Katrina and everything in between and after. Um, I pay, pay very close attention to the tropics, and they're still saying that September is going to be 
a busy month. We shall see. Let's hope not. I, I have the sense we'll be we'll be dodging some storms, but let's let's hope that we don't have to take a direct hit. Um, hey, speaking of fishing, I've got a treat today. We're going to spend the entire show with my friend, the marine artist Marty Wilson. Marty and I have fished together for a lot of years. I guess we probably won't even admit how long. Uh, he's an incredible artist. Um, the, he captured scenes that fishermen can uniquely understand from a fisherman's perspective. And his One Gulf, One Goal nonprofit is doing extremely important work in so many different areas, especially cobia, offshore fishing reefs, and just bringing awareness to conservation uh, for the entire Gulf of Mexico. It's without, uh, it's with a lot of uh, of a pleasure that I, I introduce you to Marty Wilson, someone that I've been trying to get on either one of my shows for about four years now. So, uh, Marty, how you doing, my friend? Good. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Marty. It's great to see you. So, where are you sitting today? I'm sitting. Uh in my living room at my dining room table. Yeah, and it's a special place. In fact, we're gonna, we'll are gonna we take a bit of a tour here in just a second. And for those of you watching on, on Super Talk TV or YouTube or Facebook, you'll get a treat. And for those of you listening on the radio, we'll, we'll describe to you what we're seeing. So many coastal Mississippians are familiar with your work. Uh, as an example, the, the Reef Restaurant, this huge, beautiful mirror on the side of the Reef Restaurant in Biloxi, Marty did that. And uh, so you have a sense of him. If you don't, have you, if you've not seen his immediate art, you certainly have driven by his work. He's done work for Margaritaville uh, and lots of other stuff along the coast. But you know, you've had a rewarding career, haven't you, Marty? You know, I've been so blessed, and uh, just being able to uh, grow up chasing my dreams, and I really give a lot of that to to god and my parents you know and they both you know as artists my mama taught art in the school systems for 28 years my dad had his bachelor's degree in fine art before he went into officer training to be a fighter jet pilot for the air force but i think both of them knowing what i was pursuing uh i had full support of both of them and uh started airbrushing t-shirts on the beach in Biloxi when I was 16 years old and and never looked back. I've never uh, been self-employed since I was 16, you know. So, you know, can't can't think of a better uh, lifestyle. And my mom always said, you know, son, just find something you love to do and be passionate about it. You'll never work a day in your life. And and uh, and that's just such a great statement to make to your children because that's really all you hope for for them yeah listen um i'm so proud of your children incidentally they're both doing so well <laughs> uh and then your granddaddy now man congratulations yeah thank you i don't know uh i, I you know they couldn't quite see it and see their kids calling me grandpa and i can't either really to be honest just because i'm kind of stuck at 35 but you know, she said, well, what we're going to do is, is, uh, we're just, we're just going to go ahead and have her call you captain. I went, that's perfect. Uh, captain. I, lo I love that. <laughs> hey, listen, it was, it was initially a little bit hard for me to sort of grapple with what my grandkids were going to call me, but, yeah. and, and became Gigi and I became Paw Paw. And I love it, man. I love when my kids call my grandkids call me Papa. Yeah. I have such a special relationship with them, and it's so much fun. But listen, uh, you speak. You, sp you spoke of your mom and your dad. Your dad and you and I did a show together in the early days of the Ricky Matthews show. It used to be called Coast View. And you know, your dad, as you pointed out, was a fighter pilot in the Vietnam War and uh, just just a hero, uh, someone I really loved. But he had a you know had Wilson's fishing camp for so long, and then your mother. Uh, I loved your mother, had such a beautiful relationship with your mother. And I love the stories that you told about growing up where a lot of kids might be outside playing ball and doing whatever. And maybe you did some of that. You certainly did a lot of fishing. But your mother would have you at the dinner table and just drawing and learning about the details of creating wonderful images. Um, boy, you have fond memories thinking about those days, don't you? Oh, yeah. And, you know, me and Mike... Uh, my twin brother, I mean, that's all we did was play ball. 
So really, uh, you know, our aspirations really were, we thought we was going to go pro because didn't every kid, you know, but uh, playing baseball was probably our, that's probably where our heart was. And then, uh, you know, we're painting on Sunday afternoons at the dining room table, you know, and I'm asking these other kids, what, what would you paint on Sunday? And they're like, well, huh? We didn't paint anything Sunday. And I'm like, wow, y'all are dysfunctional. Like, y'all don't paint on Sundays. Like, what is wrong with you? You thought it was normal. You thought oh, it was sure. normal. Hey, listen, we're talking to Marine artist Marty Wilson. You're going to enjoy the conversation because we're going to talk about conservation, fishing, and what it's like to be a wonderful Marine artist. We'll see you on the other side as we continue our conversation. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors from the Open Season Properties Studio. You know, Open Season Properties is a full service real estate company with a team approach philosophy that ensures your needs are of the highest priority, whether it's rural land sales, residential or commercial properties. Open Season Properties markets and sells real estate in Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, Alabama and Georgia. And they're dedicated to the development of long-term client relationships and an unwavering commitment to service. Go to OpenSeasonProperties.com to learn more. We're thrilled to have Open Season as the studio sponsor of Super Talk Outdoors. Just, just thrilled about it. Okay, so coming back now to my friend, the marine artist, fisherman, conservationist, Marty Wilson. He's got a great personality. And Marty, you know what I remember most? You know, you talk about... You talk about sitting around with your mother on Sundays. You figured that other kids were doing that too, but they weren't. But what I remember about you, even early on, because we I, we go back a long way, is that your attention to detail. The way, for example, we'd catch a fish, and you, and say say it was a redfish, and it would have a blue tint to one of its fins, and you would just stand there and just study that, study it, and sear that that picture into your brain. You would take pictures of it. You were just obsessed with capturing the essence of every single detail. Has that always been something that you sought to, to do? Well, of course. But, you know, um, you know, my dad having the fish camp uh, when he retired and then throwing us on the back of a shrimp boat was really by doing that as children really – is why I fell in love with the, the Gulf of Mexico and the marine life. And we already loved fishing. I mean, <clears throat> we lived in Okinawa and the Reiki Islands off Japan. And my dad, you know, we got introduced to, to really fishing over there and, and fishing out of the ocean and the amazing creatures that come out of the ocean. And then even here and the appreciation for that, for, you know, all the weird stuff like the mantis shrimp and the midshipman and the and the stargazer that has the bioluminescent uh, spots on his belly, you know, just all that is just really, really has always interested me. I've always done well in science, but then, you know, artists, I think are, are you know, they were our, our true first recorders and historians because they were painting and drawing in those details to record those things but um man you know uh we're so lucky to live here so you know uh yeah it's, it's, all the time you know all you got to do is is if you want adventure go south <laughs> <laughs> it right is listen I, I said go. after katrina i said after katrina a lot um that one of the most important things we could do is get the beach cleaned up. So even though there was destruction behind you, you could still look south and 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 remember why we live here and why it was so important to come back after after the storm. But you know, listen, I've had the opportunity to fish with you for for a lot of years, and uh, you know we <laughs> we've had some some great trips together. In fact, I, I've, it, it, it never fails. A, a picture will pop up of any number of trips that we've been on and you'll be in the picture somewhere, uh, whether it's, you know, catching tuna or a mangrove snapper or a dolphin. I mean, we, we've, we've had some great trips together, haven't we? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, and you know, it, it takes a minute of doing that, you know, of a lifetime to realize that, you know, these, 
these young bucks get on the boat and they look they want to learn they're in my back pocket they want to know they want to learn how to tie knots they want to learn all this stuff about fishing because they think it's about the fishing but really you know these offshore adventures are really about the relationships that you build along the way and the amazing friendships that you build you know the the fish go away that you have the pictures and you eat them and but really it's those relationships man and, and they and they and they don't get it but they will and 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 those guys that they fish with are going to become their 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 best friends their rider dies their right hand their top five you know what i mean oh yeah yeah hey listen uh i'm looking behind you at this art and and for people who are listening on the radio there's a a beautiful a painting of a brown pelican behind Marty. And it reminds me of the trip that we took to the salt domes to the, uh, off of um, uh, the, the horseshoe rigs and caught three huge yellowfin and a nearly 100-pound amberjack. Had to come home early, I remember, because we didn't have any other space to put, to put fish. It was but, <laughs> but, but that day... But that day, it was a it was an absolute incredible day. But I remember that. Do you remember the 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 uh, pelican getting caught in the fishing line, and you just gently reached out and grabbed it and held it and untangled it and released it? Uh, that's those are the memories that I that I remember. <laughs> Don't well, you? Those guys all are friends. Like they're all they're doing is they're just trying to get them another meal to get them through another day. You know. <laughs> You 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 wonder what that light that day in the life is of that brown pelican. You know um, that piece behind me hasn't been released yet, but you know he's pretty intense, and he, you're right inside of his personal space. So the name of that piece is called Fight or Flight. Oh, buddy, and it's it is really good. I really want to encourage you if you're listening on the radio to go to. Super Talk YouTube page and see the show. You can see it at Super Talk Outdoors, also the Facebook page as well. But uh, it is it is it is menacing actually. What a what a what a cool picture of he might stay there or he might be getting ready to bolt. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's might, definitely it's might, definitely true. Bite you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Marty, dude, let's do this real quick. Um, grab the phone up if you don't mind, and let's take a little bit of a tour of your house. And again, we're, for the the radio audience, we'll describe what we're seeing, what you're looking at. Of course, the one that's behind them now is uh, the pelican. So, uh, yeah. So let's uh, just kind of take us on a quick walk around, Marty, and let's look well, at some I, of your other art. I've been working on for probably about a year, I'm trying to finish it up. Is that, that's the original for that particular one, huh? That's the original. It's about seven foot tall. Ooh, man. That is that is special right there. Here. So, yeah, here's another brown pelican from a few years ago, and it's it's been very popular for you, hasn't it? Yeah, this is at uh, Deer Island. You know, we used to live right beside, uh, in between the hard rock and the bow with the wind jammer, and this this guy would come and and get on this channel marker and roost every single night like you know we were saying like what is the day in the life of a brown pelican so he's out fishing all day and he goes and gets on that gets on that channel marker at night you know this and is, there's big oh, mo this is a oh. what he's showing us is a picture of a grouper and what's so cool about this picture he's kind of hiding itself in the reef you can see the light shining on it in this clear water, but Big Mo was a hit from day one, wasn't it, Marty? Yeah, and you know, this is a Nassau grouper. I was actually down in uh, Cozumel on on uh, on a on a reef system called Palancar. Uh, I was hand feeding some black grouper, and there was probably about four or five, sixty to eighty pound blacks, and I'm hand feeding them fresh fish fillets. And down there with the grouper, you just hold your hand out like this and you squeeze it and they come right up to your hand. You turn your hand over and you float that fish up to them and they just suck it up <laughs> like vacuum feeders, right? And this little Nassau kept hanging out back here on the back of my tank because he was maybe, maybe 15 pounds, maybe. And uh, everything out in front of him, you know, could have ate him. So that was... The business end that he was staying away from and he 
kept coming in and letting me feed him. And I took a couple pictures of him. I got home. I thought, I'm going to paint these pictures, these black grouper. And really, the Nassau was the was the painting. And Mama named him Big Mo, he, you know, because really. Hey, he listen, Palancar Reef, that's where I went on my honeymoon with Ann. And my memory of, of being there was she nearly got swept away by the tide movement was so intense oh, but oh yeah it's a, yeah it was a, it was interesting but what a beautiful place yeah it's all drift diving it's a this piece is called deja blue this is two blue marlins free feeding right at daybreak um, yeah it's flyers it, you've seen that before in real life haven't you yeah well all my paintings are from actual real life experiences i won't paint it unless i've lived it caught it touched it ate it you know what i mean yeah Fished water with it but this was uh that was one morning on the rainmaker and we had just gotten to our spot and there was flyers flying everywhere and these two blues were up there just raising hell uh chasing these flyers <laughs> i put baits out put ballyhoo dropped all the way down to just naked ballyhoo without even a uh uh you know, without even a head skirt, nothing, couldn't get him to be nothing. And I thought, you know, all I needed was just a, a five gallon bucket of flyers because you got to feed them what they're eating. And that's all they wanted that day, you know. Hey, when we when we come back on the other side with Marine artist Marty Wilson, we'll talk a little bit about more. We'll take a finish this, uh, this bit of a tour and then we'll take a look at his one golf, one uh, goal effort, really important conservation effort. We'll see you after this. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors from the Open Season Property Studio. Are you looking to purchase your perf that perfect piece of hunting property, upgrade your farm equipment? Or have you been dreaming of owning your slice of heaven out in the country? Look no further than Mississippi Land Bank for your financing needs. For more than 100 years, fa farming families and landowners in North Mississippi have turned to Mississippi Land Bank for all uh, kinds of financial solutions, whether it's for land, equipment, or livestock. For more information, Visit MSLandBank.com or go by and see one of their friendly staff at any of their offices, just like my friends did, and bought some terrific land with the help of Mississippi Land Bank. So let's get back to my friend Marty Wilson. Uh, he's a marine artist on the coast, someone I've fished with for so many years. We've had, we've had a lot of great times on the coast. But, Marty, I talk about this all the time, and you know at the beginning of the show I talk about Mississippi being the capital of the outdoors in America. You also have hunted all over the state. When you think about the Mississippi Delta, the turkey season that takes place, and of course the white-tailed deer and, and duck hunting, and what we have access to, both, both in backwaters and offshore, I think about Grenada Lake and, some, and the crappie fishing, and I, I could, the list goes on and on. But man, we we got a we got an easy claim to stake when it comes to saying it's the capital of the outdoors, don't we? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, if you can't if you can't you know chase your passions here in Mississippi, I mean, and and you know fall in love with it. I don't I don't know where you'd live. It'd yeah, be hard yeah. to try to figure that out because you can go you can go north and. You know, hunt flooded timber, greenheads, wood ducks, and then jack up in a stand and kill a nice whitetail, or you can go south and get your trout redfish, and then go green water, cobia snapper, and then a little bit further, and you're catching blue Martians and wahoo tuna dolphin. Come on. Come on. <laughs> hey, We're listen, this may be one of the rare places in America where you can shoot a world-class whitetail and duck hunt in the same morning, and then go catch redfish on the coast in that afternoon. <laughs> think, just think about that for a minute. It's it's it's, you know, it's completely doable. <laughs> that's that's the incredible reality of it all. But listen, to Marty, along the way, you got you got super passionate about cobia. We call them lemonfish. Uh, cobia is a, a more formal name, but uh, we've lemonfish on the coast for forever and have had some incredible success over the many years. But you got really passionate about it, and it eventually actually evolved into creating a nonprofit called One Gulf, One Goal. We'll come back to that in just a second, how it evolved into that. But your your passion for Cobia is really in your soul, isn't it? Well, 
anybody that's done that, you can see how quickly that could happen. But, um, you know, we've been, there was a guy, one of my best friends, and he's no longer with us, but his name was Max Pace. And he's out of Hattiesburg and he'd come down, this was in the eighties and we'd go Kobe fishing all day before Kobe fishing was a thing. And that's all we did was chase, chase Kobe's and get down around Britain Sound and go all the way down to Sulphur City. And, and uh, you know, we were making a Cobia jig called the Gigolo. And, uh, you know, uh, and then Jim Frank started the tagging program and me and Max kind of uh, went back and forth as top taggers in the state for like the first five, six years, you know, cause we were catching them. So we were like, yeah, we'll, we'll do our part and start tagging some fish, you know, and, uh, you know, and Jim, Jim, I got to be great friends with Jim Franks and what an amazing uh, scientist and benefit that we've had to have him here and the research that he's done on. Yeah, I, lo I love Jim. Phobia. Yeah, yeah, he's awesome. But, um, you know, chasing those fish for that long and then. And then we started fishing the world championships and, and, uh, you know, I ended up, uh, we won it twice and then been in the top five, three or four times, like out of Destin. And, uh, but man, that, that, that fishery is in trouble. It's been in trouble and we're just trying to come up with some solutions to try to fix that. Yeah. I mean, you think, think about a Cobia is a, is a largely a migratory species i mean there are some some that stay here year round but for the most part you, we, we watched them come through that destin area and then around to the rigs and to the mississippi mississippi coast of the Bear islands off mississippi and we've uh, you know it's been so good for so long that and the pressure has been so intense yeah. um, that we've learned a lot about how to conserve that species but we haven't implemented everything that we've learned and that's that's frustrating isn't it it is because uh, we've learned a lot about the migratory habits and the patterns, but not how to stop man from destroying it and overfishing it. And that's kind of what's happened. And, and, you know, one of our mantras for the uh, foundation is, is our hashtag uh, 40 below, let them go. Cause I think just, and, and really we don't have to wait for our state legislators in our in our in our agencies to set those regulations as fishermen we just got to change our mindset of how we think about it because just because it says 36 is legal doesn't mean you have to kill him because he's only 17 pounds so that fish gets 135 pounds come on we can do better than that stop killing the baby puppy labrador retriever before he grows into his feet yeah. stop it just yeah, stop. yeah. I and think for, the other thing, like, yeah. stop gaffing the fish, like well, nets, nets. I can't say it enough. Nets, just net the fish. Measure him. Stop measuring with a piece of stainless that puts a hole in him, and he bleeds to death. So you can't. You can, you just got to quit doing that type of stuff. And these these young bucks go, well, he's legal, you know, and it's a unicorn because they never caught one in their whole life, and they probably won't, and their son won't either. They keep that up. You know what I mean? Like, stop doing that. Hey, listen, as you know, I keep a keep a big net in, in the boat. And Jordan went out last week, and he caught two. One was really nice, and one was borderline. Of course, they, they let the borderline one go. One was 40-something. I, I don't remember how big it was, but it was it was a big one. I'll send you a picture when we get off the show. But um, – but they, but they use the net to get them both. I mean, you, you know, they're not taking anything for granted. We always, we, unless it's just a monster. I mean, we're not gaffing. We're gonna, we're gonna use the big net. In fact, he told me when he got home, he said, the second one kind of tore the net up. I said, great. I'm glad to hear that, man. We'll just get a new net, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that. Because you know, when you, when you net a big one and put them in the boat, they can go crazy. Oh, no. um, that's one you don't want to have your legs near. We both learned the hard way about that, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's been fun watching you on that, Marty. Uh, kind of lead the way in the, in this discussion about let if it's under forty inches, let it go. Uh, you know, a lot of the work. I think mean, the show actually is dedicated to 
uh, our kids, you know, and, and what I what I want to I, I often think of Haley Barber, Governor Haley Barber after Katrina, when he gave that now famous speech at the special uh, legislative session talking about what we're going to do in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. He said, what are our kids and our kids kids going to say of us? Are they going to say we got it? Mm. Well, that actually applies well to natural resources and the conservation of important species, whether you're talking about ducks or deer or turkey or cobia. And we've got to all do our share. You know, the same thing happens with speckled trout. I mean, what we see is the, the limits continuing to rise on, on terms of what you can keep. But we, we enjoy letting those fat mamas go. You know, we, we, we take our pictures and we let them go. People are surprised by that. But I think more and more people are doing that. This, this conservation ethic that is beginning to develop, um, we just need everybody to sort of, you know, be with us on that. And we can, we can have a situation where our kids and our kids' kids say of us, thank you, that they got it. And that's your goal, isn't it? It is. And that, that, that 40 inches gives that fish at least one chance to spawn. So whether that fish is an early spawn or a late spawn, when he's born, that dictates whether that 36 inch fish had actually got to spawn or not before he was harvested. So that that's something we need to work on trying to get that raised to 40. But even if we can't, we there's power in numbers and everybody has a voice. And, you know, that's kind of our mantra with the foundation is come on. Look, we don't we don't have to wait for change be the change you want changed and that's the whole premise here to inspire the youth to make the changes of the planet and 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 protect your natural resources without having to wait for somebody else to do it you do it it's yeah. your it's yours and you you and your family and the way you approach conservation you're 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 the exact same way, Ricky, and that's why you know we're birds of a feather, and I appreciate you and everything you do for our Gulf Coast. And listen, well. you mentioned Jim Franks. Uh, we could do a whole show about Jim Franks, but what he's brought to bringing attention to the issue, particularly around cobia, through the tagging program, has been incredibly important. And we're coming to the end of the segment, but we'll pick it up on the other side. I remember when I caught my first tag fish. It was it was tagged by Captain Steve West at Camille Cut, and I called it at 108 <laughs> offshore. So yeah, so you know, I mean, classic classic migratory scenario. You know, hey, when we come back on the other side, we'll continue our conversation with marine artist Marty Wilson. We'll see you after this. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors from the Open Season Property Studio. Listen, no matter what kind of hunting you're into. Whether you're looking for 40 acres or 4,000 acres, if you're looking to buy land, uh, you need someone you can trust. He's a hunting land hunter. Call Lake Pickle from Open Season Properties at 601-750-2487. Look up Lake Pickle. He's a regular on this show. He and Jordan Blissett both uh, enjoy the friendship with both of those young men. They're doing wonderful things, especially more recently as they have now acquired the uh, Speak the Language podcast. Uh, for Primos, that now they own that now, and it's you know had millions of downloads. They're they're representing Mississippi as ambassadors in incredible ways. Okay, back to my my show with Marty Wilson. I was telling Marty during the show that I have to have him back on a regular basis. I knew that the chemistry was going to be good because we spent a lot of time together. You know, I re Marty, I remember after Hurricane, excuse me, after September the 11th, I had just become publisher of the Sun Herald, and you you drew this incredible setting of when. Uh, they they sort of resurrected the flag at the World Trade Center site. Um, man, you got a lot of positive press off that, didn't you? I did, but that wasn't really the the inspiration of the reason I did that. You know, look when when that happened, that just moved everyone in America, and then your heart just went out to you know all the families that that. Uh, were lost and 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 uh you know trying to figure out how to do something to help those people and there was a bible under my coffee table and i pulled it out <laughs> i can't do this man yeah, <laughs> yeah. Woo. oh my goodness that go ahead that brings back all those emotions of when that happened but um you know you had to believe that 
you know, God was there on yeah. that many souls leaving the planet instantaneously like that. And it, it just really, um, you know, uh, inspired me to do something that was uh, faith based and and um, patriotic to to create a piece of artwork that I could sell. We created a, a website called Amen America. 100% of the proceeds went up to New York to the families that were, you know, and really I was really um, looking for the the children that were left without parents. And, yeah. uh, and George uh, Bush and Clinton had formed a uh, scholarship program for all the, the kids that were left without parents. And then we ended up funneling that money straight to uh, that scholarship fund for for that, and it ended up on Good Morning America and things like. That. Yeah, it was a it was a big deal, and it was in of course the Sun Herald uh, wrote about it, and you and I talked a lot about it during that time. But on December the fourth, following September eleventh, actually, you may remember I went to the World Trade Center site, and as a you know as a former paramedic, it just so turns out my sister was with me and an editor from New York Times. I ended up doing CPR on a guy uh, for over 20 minutes with a guy from uh, Verizon, and the guy lived. And I tried to get him to tell a story because here's a guy who at the World Trade Center site literally died, and then he we he came back because of, of the CPR and lots of good medical attention, and I uh, tried to get him to tell the story. I tried to get him... To, 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 because it's to, what he experienced and what he talked about was a lot of hope, and he talked about he talked about the uh, the light that he saw, and that he felt so hopeful. And I thought that would have been a positive story for the families to hear. And there, for the people on YouTube and Facebook and Super Talk TV, you can see the piece that he drew. It's just an incredibly inspiring piece. And again, all the proceeds went to September 11th uh, Im impacted families. So listen, uh, Marty, coming back to you, one coast, one goal. It has continued to build ahead of steam. You got all kinds of cool stuff going on in the short time we have left. Talk about the the reef project you guys are involved in. Well, we we last uh, spring we put out six point six million pounds of artificial reef material in uh, FH fourteen. Uh, we put a project in the in the state portal, and uh, uh, Governor Tate Reeves has. Uh, awarded us 1.9 million to build 300 more artificial reefs at that uh, 10 foot by 10 foot by 10 foot footprint. Um, uh, and what's been being done are these um, 10 foot tall pyramids with windows in them that look very man-made house. I'm, I'm really, uh, so I'm looking at some things that look uh, and designing some stuff that are more organic that look like they would fit in the marine environment. I'm right now I'm uh, uh, having conversations with uh, the CEO of a company called Mudbots, which is a 3D concrete printing company. They can print an 1,100 square foot house in with $3,500 with square with a concrete in seven and a half hours. Like so, that's the idea is maybe grow these and 3D print these artificial reefs. That would be awesome. Listen, the next time we come back together again, we're going to drill down on one coast, one goal, so people can understand what we're doing. And the goal around the fishing reefs offshore are so important to Mississippi. You look at what Alabama and other states have done. We need to, we need to be there with them. But anyway, we're out of time for the Marty, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. You bet. It's been, uh, it's been a great show. Listen, always stay safe when you're in the outdoors. Always put safety first. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.